This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. Welcome to Ramdas Here and Now, and I'm Raghu Marcus, and I haven't been here for a couple of weeks because we just came back from Maui, where we had this wonderful retreat, Open Your Heart in Paradise, with Ramdas Krishna Das. Sharon Salzberg, Mirabai Bush, and others, including our special guest, K.K. Shaw, who, as some of you know, or many of you know, um, was uh, with Ramdas when he first met Maharaji named Karoli Baba in the foothills of the Himalayas, and was his first translator and host. Maharaji sent him right over to his house to experience Indian family, which we had a nice discussion about at the uh, at the retreat. Uh, some of that is up on ramdas.org for those of you who want to take a look. There is some kind of a scrapbook of some of the events and some of the talks and some of the kirtan and so on from Krishna Das. So, unfortunately, that did prevent me from. Uh, from moving on doing these last couple of weeks podcasts, which uh, I miss. So here we are back at it and found something really uh, incredible. Another incredible podcast from or talk from Ram Dass. Um, this took place, I think it was in England. It sounds like it because the person who is uh, asking the questions, it's with an audience and it had a, the subject of it is personality and emotions, and uh, she has an English accent, so I'm thinking that's what uh, where it's where where it is from. And uh, this is really uh, key material. I mean, it's just really incisive material, and uh, I'm really happy I, I found these. Uh, and uh, what really what I mean the basis of everything as far as me as far as i'm personally concerned is when people ask so what are you doing this life uh, what's this all about for you going to the east and finding a guru and all that and uh, it's about you're going to get enlightened <laughs> you know and i always say i haven't the slightest idea about enlightenment i really don't the only idea i have is about getting free of all of the things that separate me from everyone around me. And the idea that if I get somewhat free, then I can hopefully make some sort of positive contribution to this world. And that's what's important to me. Obviously, uh, within all of that is to uh, have that presence of Maharaji, of my guru, with me as much as possible. And uh, that's a question of, uh, obviously, grace is a, is a big part of that and my karma. But at the same time, it's doing the things that I know can help. And in this particular, so that commitment to be free, that's, that's, a, that's the, the basic uh, quotient here. And uh, in this uh, particular talk, um, Ramdas covers a few different subjects. Uh, one of them is uh, emotions and how you can use them, and another is uh, talking about uh, uh, anger, which is um, especially prominent for me. This is something that I've had uh, an issue with my whole entire life. It's kind of almost been passed down to me. My father had had an issue with it, and. Uh, and as we do, we pick up stuff from our parents. Um, so now we, Ramdas talks about, uh, as he mentions in this, uh, in this talk, that Maharaji told us, told him in particular, give up anger over and over and over. Give up anger. Not an easy thing to do. And, um, so he, he talked about, uh, Ramdas talked about anger as it's closely related to righteousness because you get angry when you think somebody else is wrong and you are right. And, uh, that sense of being wronged by another person 
is a tremendous hurdle to get over and and they do say as he mentions in the in the uh, ancient scriptures that being right is one of the last obstacles to getting into the inner temple um and uh, ramdas talks about illustrates actually he doesn't quite mention the story but there's a couple of stories and I'll mention them we might have passed them over. we might have uh, you know talked about them in in previous podcasts um but again maharaji really all the time used to talk about giving up anger i mean it was a major theme and he, you know he just say he just he would say it and it wouldn't mean there would be Go, there wasn't anything like go meditate 50 hours over in that hill and, you know, nothing like that. It was just simply give it up. One day we were, uh, in a building next door to, in the ashram in, in the, in Kenshi, the foothills. And, uh, we could see out the window, uh, where Maharaji used to sit in the front part of the ashram. We were in the back. And a few of us were sitting there, and Ramdas happened to be. We heard the screaming going on, and we, we knew it was Maharaji. And Ramdas looked out the window, and he, Maharaji, was absolutely excoriating somebody. He was screaming at them. I mean, he looked like the angriest person that ever lived. I mean, this guy was shaking like a leaf. And Ramdas got really upset and was like, ran down there. I mean, I don't think he ran down right away. I don't quite remember the sequence, but it was soon after. And he said, you say to give up anger? Meanwhile, you've been screaming at this guy, you know, and so on. And Maharaji said to him, you can be angry at somebody, but you cannot throw them out of your heart. And Ramdas in this talk talks about the kind of anger where it's coming from love and equanimity, where it serves that person and you are not separating yourself out. Now, that's a highly difficult state to get into, but it's worth pondering. And, um, turns out that the, the, uh, you know, the, the guy that he was yelling at, his name was Sharma, poor guy. Uh, he actually was, uh, I don't know what he, he was doing something about potato. Either he let them rot, uh, because he wasn't taking care of it properly, or he might have even been shifting a few potatoes out the door of the back there for a couple of shekels. I'm not, something like that. And, uh, the, the other, but the incident that, that, uh, Ramdas was talking about was when he once, he came to the, um, temple in uh in the foothills kenji and uh we were he had walked from uh the the local town nearby you know about a 15 mile walk and we were all there eating and across the courtyard from maharaji he was sitting there and we were eating and then ramdas showed up and one of us uh one of the satsang western satsang gave Ramdas a plate of food. This is a famous story that's been told over and over, but in this particular lecture, I don't think he actually tells it, but what happened was he was so angry, Ramdas, at all of us for what he called our adharmic behavior. In other words, pretty much selfish behavior. And, and uh, he threw the, pa- the, the plate right in, right in the face of this, this guy. <laughs> And, you know, you can't do any worse than throwing food at anybody in India. And, and of course, it was right in front of Maharaji. And uh, so he, he, he again reinforced in, in Ramdas and in us that you had, you know, that to give up anger day by day by day and, uh, and that he would help. And Ramdas talks a, a, a lot of a very incisive, uh, stuff, uh, he, about anger. And, and, you know, it's, we, it's, we are all in that same place. I'm sure that every one of us, every one of you listening and, and myself way included, uh, when you get angry, you, you're pushing away somebody. I mean, you have to, that immediately creates a divide. When you push away at something, it separates you. It defines who you are not. 
and you identify with that. It's just a tremendous negative. Uh, whenever you hold on to anger, even if you're right, you just end up cutting yourself off. You know, and in this thing, at one point, Ramdas says it was just too painful to be right, even though he was right in certain circumstances. It was costing more than it was worth, he says. And, uh, and herein lies when you have a commitment to getting free, that cost becomes way too much. And you, you know, you start to do the things that are necessary to get free of, in this case, anger. Now I, you know, I've had, uh, I've had some improvement, I will say, in my attachment to anger over the years, just by doing some practices. I mean, Ram Dass talks here about he does his mala. When he sees himself starting to separate from an individual, he steps back, he stops, he he gets into a silent place, and he does his uh, mala rosary. Ram, Ram, Ram. Do your mantra. Do whatever it is. Take a breath. Do a yoga asana. Whatever it is that cuts that moment off where you're going to follow that anger. And usually anger, when you get angry about one thing, you're poor, tons of frustrated stuff from your past into it. At least that's uh, something that I am well familiar with. But I must say, after years of practice and so on, I am way more able to catch that place where I, the tipping point of falling off the edge into, into that anger, which completely, utterly separates you from, from that other person. And, you know, and it's all reactive. We're just reacting, you know, to what's outside uh, coming in. It's not our natural state. Um, and, and you can think of this as, uh, with what's going on in the world today as, as a, as more than an individual thing, it's, it's, it's something of, of states, of, of countries, of governments and, and the way that they act. Um, uh, when I was uh, one last little tidbit, when I was uh, at the retreat, um, just hanging out with, uh, my wife, Saraswati and Sharon Salzberg. And she was telling us because she's been closely associated with Burma through medita meditation trainings and so on and people she knows over there. Um, she was really closely following, uh, President Obama when he went over and, uh, to that area. And she, he talked about at one point the tradition of metta that exists there. Loving kindness, that's uh, metta. That's such a, an important, important teaching that uh, Sharon, by the way, Sharon Salzberg, S-A-L-Z-B-E-R-G dot com, who's an absolutely wonderful proponent of loving kindness meditation. And uh, I, I just was so happy when she told us that, you know, God knows that President Obama you know, hasn't fulfilled maybe everybody's desires and maybe it's not so possible in this country for any president to do that. But just the fact that he's aware of loving kindness is, is incredible. And that is certainly an anecdote, antidote to anger, that practice. So highly recommend it. And uh, so take a listen. Here we are, Ram Dass, here and now. Question. How can we use our emotions positively on our spiritual path? How can we use our emotions positively on our spiritual path? If you look at the, pa the practice <clears throat> of what's called devotional yoga or bhakti yoga in Hindi, devotional yoga, you will see that you, for example, if, if your relationship is to, uh, say, Christ, you could take a picture of Jesus 
and then think about the qualities of his life and the qualities of his compassion and the qualities of his beauty of being and the qualities of his reminding people about God and you could look at that being and it would generate in you if you allow it emotional responses these emotional responses are relational they are warm human responses of love of caring of tenderness then if you stay with that picture of Jesus and keep being with Jesus you will go beyond those into a deeper way of being with him of just being with him in the presence sense and that presence includes more and more of all of the, what is all emotions all at once but you go through the emotional doorway you use your emotional heart to be to, as a vehicle to getting into that deeper way of being with God okay that's one way um, the other kinds of emotions that are generated, emotions like anger, um, sadness, uh, joy, uh, all of them, a whole range of them. Um, what one cultivates um, is a spaciousness or an awareness that allows you to um, acknowledge the feelings and it comes back to the word appreciating again acknowledge the feelings and allow them and see them as part of the human condition they're all generated they're like thought they're subtle thought forms emotions are really subtle thought forms and they're all arise they all arise in response to something they're reactions that come if somebody goes like that you have a certain emotional response if they go like that you have a different response if they go like that you have a different response and you can feel how re reactive your emotions are to situations they're all part of a lawful reactive domain that you get uh, you keep cultivating a quietness in yourself that just watches these things coming and going and arising and passing away um, and you you learn not to um, you learn not to act out your emotions, but just to appreciate and allow them. That's part of the way in which you use them spiritually. Spiritually, you don't act out your emotions. You just acknowledge them. You don't deny them, though. You don't push them down. You acknowledge that I'm angry, but you don't have to say, hey, I'm angry. That's different. But you acknowledge it. You don't deny it. That's the key, the key thing. So the way you would use emotions is in devotional practices, you aim them towards God. And for the other kinds of emotional realms, you witness them and you sit with them and you watch them change and come and go and don't deny them and allow them because that's part of your human condition. I mean, when we talk about service, you will see how we deal with suffering and you'll see that it awakens in intense emotions and your heart is breaking and you have to let your heart break but you've cultivated another plane of reality which is one that notices and allows it a quality of equanimity that lies with it so emotions work best when you also have another plane that is not emotional going simultaneously with it actually because just getting lost in your emotional reactivity just digs your hole deeper of karma. You know? But of allowing your humanity, that's really part of it. Allowing your humanity. Yes? It's a very, uh, it's a, an interesting and delicate line to acknowledge that you feel, say, somebody, somebody says something and it hurts you and then you feel hurt to acknowledge that you feel hurt the question is they did what they did because that's what they did that's their problem you reacted the way you reacted because that's the way you reacted. that's your problem right <laughs> to interpret to interpret that your feeling is their problem 
is when you start to feel you have to tell them that you were hurt by what they said. The other thing is, if I'm hurt by what you say, that's something for me to work with. I acknowledge it and then I work with it. I don't have to get them to not do the thing because they're just being like a tree. They're just phenomena happening. This is a different, this is not psychological relational stuff we're talking about. We're talking about spiritual stuff now. We're talking about how you get out from under it, not how you keep digging it deeper. Do you understand? And most people don't want to hear this. I mean, I'm, I'm playing on thin ice now because, and I'm an old psychologist and I used to wallow in this stuff, so I'm really telling you that if you get me mad, that's my problem. And that changes relationships as we will see when we get to the relationship group. Okay, we'll leave it now for the relationship group because that'll come up a lot in the relationship group. I'm absolutely sure about it. <laughs> Okay, let's go on. Next one. Next question is about anger. Um, when your guru told you to drop anger, what did this mean? And is it something we all need to do? The question is about anger. How do you deal with anger? And when, you're, when my guru said, give up anger, uh, how to interpret that? Now, um, anger usually is intimately related to righteousness. You'll notice that when you get angry at somebody, it is because you feel you have been wronged and you have a sense of right. right? And it is said in the spiritual literature that righteousness and being right is one of the last gates to the inner temple. It's one of the last obstacles to getting in the inner temple. And that one of the problems of spiritual work is ending up being a good yogi. You are a really good yogi. You know all the slokas, shlokas, you know all the positions, you do it all perfectly right. And you are really righteous and good, but you're not free. And it's called the golden chain, the chain of righteousness. And you certainly see that in most religious traditions, that the priest class gets very caught in being good, in being right. And freedom lies behind good and evil. It lies behind right and wrong. It's the one that lies behind the two. It goes behind all polarities. When you want to become free, then your righteousness and your anger are much less interesting than they used to be. You less feel comfortable just sitting in your righteousness than you do in throwing it back into the pot in order to become free. And what my guru was saying to me was, become free, let go. And he wasn't saying, work it out, he was just saying, let it go. Now when I was angry at all those people at the temple, I was right about every one of them. I mean, there was no doubt about it. They were irresponsible, sloppy. Uh, I had a reason for every one of the 34 people that I was angry at, 30 some odd people. <laughs> They were all inadequate to the situation. And, um, and he said to me, let go. He said, I told you to love everyone. And I said, yes, but you told me to tell the truth. And the truth is I don't love everyone. And he said, love everyone and tell the truth. <laughs> now that's interesting. Because that's like, is putting two things together that don't go together. But they don't go together from where I'm standing. So what he was saying to me was, when you finish standing where you think you are, in which they don't go together, you will end up standing in a place where they go together. Right? Where the truth is, you love everyone. And that was incomprehensible to me, because I looked over and I hated all these people. But as I looked at them, with the, his words in my heart and mind, 
I looked and I saw that I hated their actions, but right behind that, if I just shifted my gaze just a little bit, they were all souls caught in their own stuff, which led them, their fears, which led them to do thises and thats, and led me to do thises and thats and judgment, and right behind it were these beautiful, pristine souls that I loved very dearly. And so I flicked my gaze, and I looked and I saw that I loved them. And I was angry at actions, but not at beings. I also saw that anger is divisive. Anger keeps, when you're angry, you push against something. When you push against something, it separates you. It defines what isn't you. And yet I understood that where I'm going to is a place which embraces the universe and experiences the unity of all things. So that every time I held on to anger, even if I was right, I ended up cutting myself off. And I had lived years and years with a heart that was closed and tight and cut off. And I could feel it affecting my body, it affected everything about my life. I was so alienated from life by my anger and my righteousness and my judgment, which came out of my own sense of inadequacy. Can you hear that, that issue? It may be familiar to some of you. <laughs> and what I then realized was that it was too painful to be right. It was costing me more than it was worth and that I wanted to be part of the flow of the universe rather than to be sitting in judgment of it. And that the anger was not going to get me to God. I heard what he was saying. And he said, give up a little anger each day and I'll help you. And I started to respond that when anger arose, instead of cultivating it and, you know, fertilizing it and watering it and feeding it, I just said, the hell with it. It's not going to get me where I really want to go. It's a way station along the way, but it's not going to get me there. And even though I'm right, I'm going to give it up. Because I looked and I saw in, as we'll see in politics, which we're going to discuss in a few minutes, I saw in politics the way in which anger was divisive and it polarized people. And I saw that you had to be able to oppose people without anger. And that anger was not necessarily a functional commodity. And that I could just let it go. And it was hard because there was pride involved. Because I was right. And he didn't say work it out. He didn't say sit down and you say, well, I was a little wrong. And you say, well, I was a little wrong. And everybody feels better. That wasn't what he said. He said, give it up. He didn't say work it out. And I realized that went counter to my whole psychological training. But I decided that I wanted to be free. And I just give it up. And it's been very difficult. Extremely difficult. Because often the people that I am angry at are... I'm really right, <laughs> you know? And then I realize that I am not free, and I want to be free, and so I let it go. And if they've done stuff that is inappropriate, that's their problem. My job is to keep my heart open, because if my heart is open, they can change that much faster. I don't have to sit in judgment. I don't have to play God with everybody around me. And so I have practiced letting my anger go. And I would say that I have about one-tenth of the anger I had 15 years ago. I was a very angry person, very judgmental and very angry, and held grudges. And I would say I don't have those anymore. I think there are maybe a couple of people that I have stuff to work out with at this moment, that I have stuff where I'm holding something. And it's very painful to me, and I see that I have to let it go people that I've worked very closely with, where I feel that I've gotten caught in my own judging mind. And that's my problem, and I've got some work to do. I don't see it as something what I'm right any longer. I just see it as a problem. Okay. I can see. But just take a couple of questions and go, on. yes? Now, there is an anger that comes that's called dharmic anger. That, the only kind of anger that is appropriate is when you love another person so much 
that the anger is come as a device for liberating them out of your love. If you're identified with your anger, forget it. His, you've got to assume his love for all these people was so intense that he was doing that as a teaching and that was all part of the storyline. You know? Because if he hadn't done that, the rest of the story wouldn't have happened. I mean, that's the part of it that's always tricky, you know, because you, you want to make it into a melodrama. But, I mean, Christ needed Judas just as, you know, I mean, everybody was necessary for the story. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah, well, anger, you've got to watch that anger comes out of judgment. And you can say that something is inappropriate and do something to stop it. The question is whether the anger is a correlate that's useful or not. And it is only useful, I think, when it is rooted in love and equanimity. When the anger is an intentional emotional response that you use as a teaching device out of your love and equanimity. When you are caught in it, I do not, I think it's divisive. All right, it's a strong way of saying that. Yeah, last one. About what? Dharmic anger. That ang that's what I just said again. Anger that comes out of love and equanimity. When I love you so much, like in, in Tibetan Buddhism, there are stories of the guru who kept, keeps beating the student and keeps frustrating him and, and being very angry and irritable. And actually, that wasn't the guru at all. That was merely a functional behavior that came out of the love and the wanting to liberate the other person. Right? It wasn't coming out of any real anger in the person. There was no hatred in it. The anger came out of compassion, it came out of love. To liberate the other person from whatever they were stuck in. But that's a, a very delicate relationship. That's very rare that one is in that role to do that. Right? I mean, you can be as angry as you want as long as you love enough. Because if you love enough, the anger is a very different kind of anger. I mean, there are, there are times when you act strongly. Like, when you st study parent-child relationships, you will see that when the parents, when the love between the child and the parent is strong enough, the parent can use anger, the anger can arise, and it doesn't threaten the love. It comes out of such intense love. On the other hand, there are other kinds of parent-child relationships where the parent gets so lost in their anger that the love is lost. That has an entirely different effect on the child. Then the child feels very insecure. The other way, because we used to do studies to determine whether spanking a child affected their development. Turned out spanking doesn't, isn't a variable that makes any difference at all. It depends on whether you spank with love or you spank with withdrawal of love. You can hear that. Next question. Ramdas. Yes. Um, we're going to start with fear. Fear. Fear, yes. And uh, we're quite a frightened group, so we'd like the support of everybody to be courageous enough to ask our questions. Um, Emmanuel says that fear is the only issue, and it became apparent for all of us in our group that we'd spent <clears throat> our whole life in a reactive dance of fear. And when we examined that, we realized that very often the thing we were frightened of wasn't nearly as frightening as the fear, and that it became the fear of the fear of the fear. And we wanted to try to understand what the fear is, what the thing is that we're so frightened of, um, and whether that energy is something that we can transform. Is it our friend? Is it our foe? And how practically can we deal with it as well as understanding it? Okay. Well, well presented for a frightened person. <laughs> Fear, um, 
Fear is the result of getting, um, how to say it, is getting caught in the middle. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Buddha says it's the result of ignorance and the ignorance is uh, that when you start out as an infant with an undifferentiated awareness and then you are taught who you are that that component that um, structure which we call ego is a very fragile structure. It seems tough, but it's actually a very fragile structure, and it's a structure that is that is created of mind, of learned uh, neural patterns, if you will, and it is it has on one side of it what Freud referred to as the id or the the impulse life, which the structure is designed to interface between the impulse life and the society to protect the society from the impulse life and on the other hand it is this fragile structure in the face of tremendous forces externally which are parents and then social institutions and chaos and storms and nature all of it so when you didn't have a framework when you didn't have a somebodyness you are just part of the universe and there's no fear I mean a tree isn't frightened and it's not clear I mean, even like um, in one of the uh, discussions that Emmanuel had about uh, what a mouse feels like when it's being eaten by a cat, the question is, is the mouse saying, oh my God, I'm being eaten by a cat? Or is it feeling warmth and moisture and shifts in uh, temper, you know, uh, energy? And is the squealing? Do we project? We anthropomorphize and we say this: the, it's squealing because it's afraid. But to be afraid, one has to have a self-concept. And when a, an organism is functioning instinctually in a scene, each change in the homeostasis, each change in the balance of the situation is just a new moment. It's just a new moment to which it responds. Um, and so, um, for example, um, yeah, well, it's, it's, we'll stay away from that one. Uh, <laughs> um, it's very delicate to interpret uh, things because we tend to interpret in terms of where we're sitting uh, and we've developed these structures and if you can s sense the way that works just see on one side of you these extremely powerful impulses in you that you're afraid of and on the other side the tremendous forces outside that you're afraid of and feeling yourself as, as a very fragile entity within that structure and uh, so that the, f the root of the fear is the separateness. The root of the fear is the model one has of oneself. That's where the fear starts. Um, once that exists, then you process everything from inside or outside in terms of that model and it keeps reinforcing the feeling of vulnerability because in fact there are externally incredibly powerful forces outside and inside. The, the transformative process of spiritual work is reawakening to the innocence of going behind that model that one had that cut oneself off, that made oneself a, a tiny little fragile somebody. And a lot of the power preoccupations that we end up having and the especially the power of trying to leave something behind in the face of death is the feeling of our own fragility. And if you look at social structures, you see how much social institution is based upon the feeling of fragility of the human condition. So, how you deal with fear, because you say, I'm afraid of that person. I mean, you say, I'm afraid of being socially shamed. But when you are socially shamed, it hurts, and then here we still are. You're afraid of violence, and then if violence happens, sure, it's scary and painful, and then behind it, here we are. And uh, 
I think you presented it right, that often the fear feeds upon itself and we're almost afraid of the fear. Or the fear is the thing rather than what we're afraid of. We're just afraid. We're just afraid. We just feel very vulnerable. The, um, the, the ways of dealing with it, see, in, th in a therapeutic tradition, what you usually do is try to figure out what you're afraid of. Um, another technique is this witness, which merely sits with the fear and tries to get it before it becomes so um, consuming that there's no space left. There's usually a little space left. The image I usually use is if you have a picture frame, that's a, you've got a painting of a cloud, of a gray cloud against a blue sky. But you only had one picture frame and it was a little too small. So what you did was you bent the canvas around to frame it. But in doing so, you lost all the blue sky. So you ended up with just a framed gray. Right? It fills the entire frame. So when you look around, you say, I'm afraid, or I'm depressed, or something. If you added, the, enlarged the frame, so there was a little, even just a little bit of that kind of round thing of a cloud and a little blue space, you'd say, ah, a cloud, <laughs> right? That's what the witness is. The witness is that tiny little blue over in the corner that leads you to say, ah, fear. I've talked about... Um, the woman calling me in the middle of the night many years ago. And uh, she said, I, I've taken LSD and I'm going to commit suicide and I'm going crazy, I've gone crazy. I'm gonna commit suicide. She called me from California to New York State at two in the morning. So I got up and I said, yes, okay, you're gonna commit suicide and you're crazy. And uh, it's dawned on me, I said to her, look, uh, you're obviously too mad to talk to. Could I speak to whoever it was that picked up the phone and dialed seven numbers plus an area code to get me? Because whoever that is, is obviously got all their marbles and I'd like to talk to that person. See? Okay. Yeah. And in a way, that's the witness of the rest of it, see? Like, I'll dial him and tell him I'm mad, you know? It's like, and in a way, we, that's the little blue sky, and that's what we have in us all the time. Often we get so frightened, we can't stop for a moment to notice, ah, there's fear, because it's consumed us. So the art is to keep cultivating that witness, continuously cultivating it, and all the opportunities you have so that when so that it is present more and more of the time at first it's there about one percent of the time and all the rest of it's there 90 percent 99 percent of the time but over a while it gets so that it's there almost 50 percent of the time and then as you start to go into these things ah here comes fear ah here comes depression again and when you focus on the witness rather than on the fear, you see that there's a part of you that is not afraid. That's just noticing it. The noticer isn't judging it, it's not trying to change it, it's not even afraid. It's just noticing. Like somebody comes in and says, I'm depressed. I said, are you completely depressed? Yes, I'm completely depressed. You're absolutely sure you're completely depressed, yes. At this moment, as you're telling me you're depressed, are you depressed? Well, no, I'm just telling you I'm depressed. <laughs> That's the one, right there. That's the one. Okay. So in a way, recognizing that there is a part of you that always exists that is not afraid. And in the deeper mystical sense, or transformative, or spiritual sense, there is indeed a part of you that is always not afraid because there is a part of you that was never separate. 
And that part of you that was never separate, well, how could you be afraid? You are everything. What could you be afraid of? It, it's all, all it is is transformation of energy. I recall once being, uh, again, I'm sorry that so many psychedelic stories are coming out this week. I, uh, it must be somebody I'm trying to really do it to. <laughs> but I was um, in Mexico in the ocean uh, for an all-night LSD session, and um, there was a very wild surf, and I realized that if I went forward into the surf, I, since I couldn't tell the difference between up and down, I probably would drown. And I stood there and the feeling all these forces upon me. And then I realized, I felt, I got this experience of going, of imagining going into the surf and being underwater and then uh, that feeling of drowning and then shifting and then a whole new balance in relation to nature. And then I'm a bit of floating something on the water and everything changes and then there's moments in other people's minds when they say, oh, Richard, remember him? He died in the ocean in Mexico and there's all these little flickers and then everything quiets down and then there's a new balance in the universe. And it was just a little shift from that balance into that one. In one, I am the somebody doing something, and in the next, I am part of the ocean's stuff, like a piece of seaweed. And my consciousness has moved into some other plane. And it all was, once I got out of the anxiety about it, it was just a shift, a metamorphosis of balance. It's just like a tree falling and then rotting and then providing nurturance for everything else in the forest and going on. And the tree isn't upset about its change of state. And I began to see there's, there's the process of death, of the trans, just seeing transformation of energy. And the deepest fear, of course, is the death, which is the extinction of that fragile little thing that we created in the first place. Because once you get back into the mystical root being, your true self, it doesn't die. Because it wasn't born. It just is. So there's always a place that is not afraid, and that's what one works to find in oneself by that work on oneself. And that's different because if you are afraid because of that vulnerability and you keep focusing on what you're afraid of, like I'm afraid of heights, or I'm afraid of violence in the streets, or I'm afraid of this, you will keep substituting one after another. As you get rid of one, there'll be a whole new one to play with. Because it isn't really, you just pick one and then focus on it, but that isn't really what it's about. It's the fear itself from where you're standing. It's not the object, it's the subject that it's the dealing with. Question. It's interesting because as I uh, sit here waiting to ask the question, I see that part of myself that is um, invested in the question. And uh, at the same time, a part of myself that is not. Right. And um, we'll meet in both of those places. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I won't take you seriously. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm reminded of um, one of your talks in which you said uh, during the question and answer period that we would pretend we had questions and you would pretend that you had answers. Right. Um, so in that vein, my question is, when I'm quiet and when I'm still, um, as in meditation, I'm aware of the fear and the vulnerability that lies behind the contraction of my ego or the closing down. But many times, I experience this fear as a heaviness or a stuckness tightness or as anger. Now you've spoken um, at length about the anger that you worked with um, when with Maharishi and um, also the anger of pushing away your father. How do we work with the fear which underlies the contraction into stuckness or heaviness or anger? Uh, 
Um, if you design your life to um, keep tasting those mindful moments, the moments of spaciousness, after some time, as you contract, you feel the thickness and the unsatisfactoriness of the state. You don't even know why you've contracted. See, the tendency is when you contract to say, why did I contract? Was I angry? Was I tired? What was it? But you get to the point where you just treat the contraction or the kind of tightening or the closing down of the heart. You just treat it as what it is and you immediately go into whatever method you have. See, that's why I hold these beads all the time. I mean, you must see me with these beads almost all the time. Now, a lot of the time, they're just completely unconscious. But when I start to feel heavy, I feel the beads in my finger now. I, I feel, I note the heaviness. The, the noting is the heaviness. And then instead of figuring out why am I heavy, which is just going to feed the whole issue, I know that that is not necessary to be in that state, that I've closed down. And I just want to come back into spaciousness. And then it's Ram, Ram, Ram. And it's my guru going Ram, 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 Ram. And it's, 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 a, it's when you've invested in your method, because you know your method brings you out of those places, then you call upon your method at that moment. And you get so that it's an automatic process. Uh, it's almost automatic. It's mediated by one thought. It's, it's, I'm stuck, and then the next thing is Ram. It's interesting, because I sleep often with my beads in my hand. And I will awake out of a dream, and I'm still in the dream, and I can feel the thickness of the dream. And I'll just feel the bead. The bead, the sensory input of the bead starts the Ram. And then I can feel the moment where the Ram is the spaciousness and the dream is the contraction. And I'm right there and I can feel there's a pull to stay in the contraction. And then the deeper commitment to being free asserts itself. And I realized, because holding on to the contraction has a whole psychological thing around it of righteousness, of continuity, of that you don't have any right to be joyful. I mean, it, it feeds so many psychological things. But once you've made the commitment that I want to be free, you got to have made that commitment deeply enough so that at those moments you don't have to make it all over again. You've already made it. So the two commitments are, I want to let go of that thickness, and the other is, I have faith in my method. And you have faith in the method when the method's worked often enough. Right? So I'll either use my beads or I'll bring Maharaji to mind. And I'll see him giggling at me, saying, stuck again, eh? You know, and he's sort of giggling. And then I just, these just loosen it. Loosen it. How hard it is to loosen it depends on how deep in you got. And what happens is, as you keep doing your practices, you catch these things sooner. You catch them as you start to go into them, rather than after you're deep in. Like, I can start to talk to somebody, and I started from a very spacious point, and then I can feel my mind thickening as I get into wanting them to understand something. And I realize I'm losing it. And then at that moment, I just either stop or start to do the beads while I'm talking or all my little techniques work. I just keep working to loosen it, to remind me. Okay. Is a judgmental mind ever appropriate and isn't it usually motivated by fear? A judgmental mind is usually motivated by fear. Discriminating mind is, um, comes out of wisdom. To see the difference between things is wisdom. 
to get attached to preferences about it is uh, comes out of fear, which comes out of separateness. Um, the uh, judging mind usually has a root in one's own feeling of not enoughness. Now, judging of this is better than that, like this, this quiche is better than that quiche or something like that. It all depends, again, on where the attachment is inside the consciousness regarding it. That's more uh, discriminating between things. Um, the kinds of judging we're dealing with that is the problem is the judging about human beings. Uh, that's where the problem arises. And the other part of the problem is getting stuck in the judging mind. Getting stuck in the mind which is constantly judging and having preferences. Because it, it clouds your ability to see just what is without preferring this or that. Feelings lead to preferences. That whole law of dependent origination is where the root problem is that keeps karma going, that you prefer this over that, down to the root thing of preferring life over death. And judging the things that take you away from life until finally you just see this leads to this, this leads to that, and you understand how it all works. And you can say, I would, if I have a choice, I would take this, but if I don't have it, there's no clinging. I let go right away. <coughs> so, um, but the kind of judging we're talking about most of the time is rooted in fear, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> How can I judge myself less harshly and appreciate myself more? I think that part of it is observing oneself more impersonally. Um, I often use this image, which I've used already, I think, but let me say it again. That when you go out in the woods and you look at trees, you see all these different trees and some of them are bent and some of them are straight and some of them are, are evergreens and some of them are, you know, whatever. And you look at the tree and you just, you, you allow it, you appreciate it, you see why it is the way it is, you sort of understand that it didn't get enough light and so it turned that way. And you don't get all emotional about it, you just allow it, you appreciate the tree. The minute you get near humans, you lose all that. And you're constantly saying, you're to this, or I'm to this, or that, that judging mind comes in. And so I practice turning people into trees, which means appreciating them just the way they are. And um, there was a period of time where um, I used to have a picture of myself on my puja table. Later I had Casper Weinberger, but <laughs> earlier on I had me. And people would come and say, my God, what an ego this guy's got. He's got his own picture on his puja table. <laughs> This podcast has been brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate all the support for the Foundation and for Ramdas' work, and we hope that you will continue that support. You can go to Ramdas.org and click on the Donate Now button and follow the prompts. Thank you. <laughs>